I'm going to make this relatively quick. You're probably a fairly informed audience on this. But we've tried to, to make this work out. I'm going to go for the unusual suspects, the bits that I hope that don't spring immediately to mind in terms of health impacts of climate change. Tony, to my left, will be picking up on some of the other impacts, and then hopefully we'll get some solutions as well. This is my world. It's intensive care. That's where I do my clinical practice. And the feature of these sorts of patients who tend to die is either they're hit with some overwhelming impact, or much more commonly, they've been rendered very unwell with some chronic background condition, and then they get the second hit. And it's the second hit that ends putting them up there, and a third of them will end up dying. And I'd like to suggest that that's the situation we're in with our planet. So if we look at the human impact, first of all, on the planet, quite independently of climate change, hominids, hardly any of us going back two to five million years ago, human species from mitochondrial DNA only appeared probably around 130,000 years ago, and 70,000 years ago there were probably only around 10,000 of us on the planet at all. And it took until around 1804 before we even got to the first billion people on the planet in the whole of um, evolutionary history. And it took us well over a century to stick on another billion. But it took us uh, not much longer than 30 years to add another billion, um, only another 14 years to another billion. And we've been continuing to do this, sticking another billion on the planet's population every 10 or 11 to 12 years ever since. The problem is that each of those people is using more and more. So if we look at GDP per capita, fixed at $1990, you'll see that that's gone up enormously. And that means that in total, if we look at world GDP in $1990, around $600 billion in 1800, progressively rising until we're probably running somewhere around $53 trillion of fixed capital assets last year and around $79 trillion. Um, dollars so that's 79,000 billion um, in terms of circulating assets. And all of that means resource. Those are underpinned by something that's being used. And I don't want to go into mining and gold and copper and all of those other things, but let's just look at things that might fit with us. Fish, increasing and escalating use with a substantial elevation in per capita use as well. We're already up to around 20 kilograms. Not an awful lot, but it is when you're looking at 7 billion people. That means the fish stocks are collapsing, and once you go below around 300 species in any area, uh, the stocks tend to collapse because of ecosystem degradation. And we're heading on a very steep downward cycle in terms of fish stock availability. We need to grow a hell of a lot more, not just because there are more of us to eat, but a lot of those people want to eat a lot more. The richer of us in the countries like ours, where we have our obesity problems, and Ian, I guess, will touch on that later, but the poorer people, who also quite rightly have aspirations for greater consumption. We want to eat more meat, so we have to grow a lot of crops to give to the cows that produce this sort of level of meat now. And they're showing no signs at all of slowing down, and neither will it in the near future. And if you're going to grow a lot of crops, and you're going to graze a lot of cattle, you need a lot of land. And we've used up what's available at the moment in terms of access for crop use and cattle grazing. And if you draw a map of the world, which you're very welcome to do, and look at uh, the Arctic, that's an ocean, it's frozen, it's melting, you can't grow anything there, you can't grow anything on steep mountainside, you can't grow anything at high altitude, you can't grow anything in dry deserts, whether they're hot or cold, you can't grow things on the surface of the ocean. And what you're left with is stuff like rainforest, if you want to drop more, probably around 1.5 billion hectares worth left. But we're chopping it down at this sort of rate already. And that's around 20 soccer pitches a minute still going. Indeed, if there are no resource constraints, just looking at the increase in population and trying to feed it in the next 30 years, humanity in the next 30 years will consume as much food as humanity has in the last 8,500 years. That's without constraint. And all of this increased consumption and use of resource means we're damaging our ecosystems. These, the UNEP data, this really is a rate of extinction probably 10,000 times quicker than that on the fossil record. And we're losing up to eight species of index species an hour. Now that's the bad news. That's got nothing to do with climate change. Just that's what we're doing quite independently of climate change. And climate change is the acute illness that hits the chronically diseased planet. And it happens because this is what we're burning in the form of fossil fuel. All of this stuff represents 
stored carbon that's been sequestered over many, many, many millions of years that we're releasing in the blink of an eye. And this number is going up by around 3.9% per year and showing no signs at all of slowing down. The CO2 you emit from this sort of emission, well over 30 uh, gigatons a year, um, a fifth of that is still in the atmosphere in 33,000 years' time. And it's a physical property of these greenhouse gases that they trap uh, long-wave radiation and warm the planet. <coughs> so with those sorts of escalating and immediate levels of emission, that's where we currently lie. This is going back from 400,000 years ago, atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And that's what we've done here mostly in my lifetime, and I'm 50. We're now at the highest concentrations for well over 15 million years. We've achieved that in the space of 150 years. It's hard to understand what that means in terms of warming, because we get this idea, you know, small temperature rises. How, how, it, it's hard to grasp. So let's just look at the energy, the net energy imbalance. And it turns out to be around six watts per square meter. So 10 meter room probably here, maybe 10 meters at the back. This area here as a floor point is gaining around 60 watts. That's a 60 watt light bulb of heat. In terms of gain, not going anywhere, across the entire surface of the planet. That's the sort of level of energy gain you've got. And if you turn that into Hiroshima bombs, which you can in terms of joules of energy that's released, you're looking at about five Hiroshima bombs a second. So if we start adding them up, that's what you're doing a minute every day of the year in terms of net energy gain to the planet. And the net result is that the temperature is rising, there is no doubt. The Barclay data, these were data funded by climate deniers who funded Barclay to do the modelling. And you'll see rather embarrassingly the temperature was the highest of all the other records.